Okay, if not, good John, uh, the floor is yours. We can see your first slide there. Oh, good. I wondered, and, and again, some of these things we haven't practiced, so I'm not sure of the a couple of things may not animate correctly, but I thought at least I'd use this uh, as my base webinar that we presented uh, a couple times on what work we've been doing to be a springboard to the discussion of work in the Northwest and, and work under the, both the North Pacific LCC as well as the Northwest Climate Science Center, looking at uh, trying to do a bottom-up of a look at effects of potential effects of sea level rise and extreme events to uh, coastal habitats. And so what I'll do is go through uh, kind of the base of our program and then talk a little bit about where we are in the progress of doing our Northwest Climate Science Center project of looking at uh, seven selected marshes in the Northwest that we're trying to apply a, a local elevation uh, tidal and uh, uh, vegetation models to examine uh, potential uh, effects of climate change projections to uh, actual local site marshes. So with that, uh, again, this is something that is part of a joint effort between hydrologists and biologists and uh, everyone that we can figure out how they are able to uh, coordinate and provide a better answer on um, what's going on in terms of the current conditions of marshes and what their future potential is going to be. And it's, so it's been a collaborative effort of all kinds of different groups uh, working together underneath, a lot underneath USGS, under Fish and Wildlife Service, and even uh, NOAA, as well as some of the universities and other uh, agencies that, uh, that are more of a local vested interest. But hopefully uh, this will give you kind of a general gist of, of what we've been trying to do with uh, our approaches. And if you want to follow up this a little bit closer, I'll uh, start from the, be the beginning on our web page is available with some of our information I'll present here on uh, our web pages uh, for the center is www.work.usgs.gov and then forward slash SFBSLR. And this is our current uh, project we're presenting final re data on, our, our newest project we're working on uh, uh, from California out the way up to Washington on 14 different sites with the same approach, and uh, those uh, study results are also going to be uh, produced and put on this site uh, in the near future, so this is uh, a place you can come and see them. So I guess what I'll do is outline a little bit about our perspective of, of what we were seeing in, in trying to establish this program and look at threats to tidal marshes and coastal areas of uh, San Francisco Bay as a start, and then looking at challenges uh, at the local scale and what we think is important to, to start to get a baseline uh, on, as well as consequences for the invertebrates living in these specialized habitats, and finally what uh, the next steps are in adaptive management approaches and, and future research. I, I guess one of our uh, initial questions had been, given that looking at different parts of the North America, you have different ranges of, of tide from the Gulf Coast with just a couple feet of tide range, the Atlantic Coast uh, two and a half to seven and a half, and, but the Pacific Coast starting in, you know, uh, the five foot range and extending in, into Alaska above, you know, 20 to 30 feet in, in parts of it, um, how that might affect the differences in what climate change would do to the, an area and what our expectation is. So in terms of the some modeling that's been done, this is a, a results from a model by Kerwin et al, who is looking at the uh, relationship between different estuaries throughout the world in terms of threshold sea level rise uh, rates and suspended sediment concentrations by focusing on tidal range and what is the sediment concentration in the water. The place that San Francisco Bay resides is kind of in the middle there of a relatively mid to lower suspended sediment concentration estuary, but with threshold sea level rise rates that are kind of also in the middle of where there's 25 millimeters per year average going on right now. So we can kind of fit some of these different estuaries into a gradient. And this is, since that time, they've been kind of tweaked this a little bit, but the main point is that tidal range will have a big component to do with what is the effect at a particular estuary, and it's something that we've been trying to incorporate in our models. So, John, is this is this uh, something that you have an answer for or an estimate for band and marsh at this point, or something that you will develop in terms of... So, our meters are in the water abandoned, so we uh, have information there in Coos Bay uh, nearby. We expect that, you know, we've been... Um, 
I believe they were put in in the early fall, so we probably have the first quarter of data, and we're trying to get a year at every site we work at to at least get kind of the signature of uh, wet season, dry season, mm -hmm. um, and, and look at storm events uh, is for, for a particular year, even though it won't be extended uh, record. So we're just starting that, and we hope that that will be something that we can build on and, and at least have an initial one to start rough modeling of how different it is in the winter than it is during the summer. And that's one 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 site per system. Your your ideal is or or your desire is that for for uh, uh, what did you call it a uh, is this one of the set. Um, I can't even remember the name of them. No, as far as uh, we are going to do sets too, but in this particular case, as I walk through the different uh, uh, particular things we we measure, the tidal range is done particularly with uh, water level loggers, and those are then used with uh, GPS uh, RTK uh, survey work to get them to the exact elevation so we can give you a full tidal record for a year at a particular site. And we typically do one kind of upward in the marsh, and the problems with those is that you lose the bottom sometimes. When you go to low tide, it dries out because yeah. it's below the lower, uh, mean lower water. But if we do one there, we usually do one at the front of the marsh, so we have one that goes and stays underwater the whole time in the channel, and so we get a better idea of the full tidal range of lows and highs. But our focus has been initially on from mean tide level up to mean higher high water. Because that was the point of when you add water to that, what effect does it have on the marsh? Um, since that point, though, to model and to get better curves, we now put another a logger that's that's kind of at the front of the marsh, so we make sure we keep them inundated and have a full curve that we can then use in um, in the modeling efforts. And and I don't need to divert you, but I was actually more interested in this in the uh, getting uh, more accurate sediment data. And we can uh, uh, again, I Absolutely. don't want to yep. divert you from that. We can talk about that later. Or oh actually. yeah, let me uh, let me get to that part. We'll tell you where we are with that and and how uh, well we're doing with it. It is a challenge, yeah. and uh, lots of projects uh, within our project going on, uh, trying to get a better handle on that. Um, so in, in terms of variation within even in the individual estuary, it's surprising to us even in San Francisco Bay, we, when I, at least surprising to me, even having worked here 25 years, but it's that looking at the tide range in the north part of this bay, it's five and a half, and the south it's eight and a half. And so even within a particular estuary, we're going to find variation in tidal ranges that will affect how response of a particular marsh uh, may occur relative to changes in sea level and storms. So... You know, it's it's a relatively significant estuary. I'll try to gloss over a lot of these kind of like background uh, informational slides, but needless to say, because it is already heavily impacted by uh, urbanization, what our discussions here are how climate change adds to a situation that already uh, has some challenges to the ecosystem health. So in general, that climate change on top of these are already current issues of, of concern have raised uh, – questions about survival of endangered species and, and listed uh, other uh, populations that uh, are, are already threatened by fragmentation, predation, major species pollution. Um, and so that's why this is particularly of concern in highly urbanized areas as, as a kind of a, a barometer of what, uh, what the future will bring for survival of the populations in the managed marshes. Um, so we, we did about a dozen sites within this estuary, kind of a, a scatter of, of sites listed here by river sites, north, central, south base sites on where they were placed. And it was kind of opportunistic. We, we did a, a gradient that was intentional. Which ones we picked partly had to do with where we had existing data sets. So part of this is it's not a random selection of marshes, but it is a, a distributed selection of marshes that hopefully provides information about gradients and, and variation. So the the basic background that we went from is that we we're seeing already that there's a western snowpack decrease that will continue runoff should be earlier and shorter in the future water temperature and salinity are increasing in san francisco bay already uh being uh, measured and sea level rise scenarios have ranged for california's estimates from all the way from like uh tens of centimeters in the early ipcc work and now uh, even up to 2 uh, meters to 2100, which is in some of the more recent estimates. But we use the California Climate Adaptation Strategy Report value 
for most of our initial work of 1.24 centimeters is kind of conservative, but at least uh, you know showing a, a three plus foot rise in in a sea level rise what it would do to which areas. Um, and we also are very interested in how often storm events are occurring in particular marshes because this prediction uh, was recently put out by uh, Dan Kahn. It was that the re increase of 30 centimeters will reduce storm events from 100 years to 10 years. So storm frequency certainly is a big issue of how often um, these unusual uh, or high tide storm events will occur in the future. And finally, that uh, some of the initial uh, studies were already estimating losses of uh, 40 to 70 percent of intertidal habitats that become subtidal in some of the models, and we'll report and show some of our results indicating actually that's maybe conservative in San Francisco Bay. So I'll go through just the four goals and try to you know breeze through these. Please interrupt you have specific questions on certain techniques, but that's what I hope we get to at the end, and I'll just tell you about them. So we we were our goal was to try to develop a plant distribution model and use a high elevation model of a particular parcel, a tidal marsh that's managed uh, by a particular group, to be used to look at scenarios and what the effect might be locally, and we want to do this of uh, looking at endemic vertebrate response. As kind of an endpoint, a sensitive endpoint to change in salt marsh habitats, both at local and regional landscape levels, but primarily a local focus. And then our goal is to evaluate whether the marshes can accrete and carry enough sediment to actually keep up with this to some extent, or if they're drowned, and, and finally whether or not the tidal cycles, uh, we could follow those to look at inundation patterns. So that's kind of the summary of the project. We'll talk a little bit about the challenges and why working at the local scale we think is is kind of a different viewpoint but has great benefits. And certainly one of the biggest ones is that when you're working locally and you have an IPCC model that's 200 kilometer uh, pixels, it provides uh, difficulty in, in trying to get interpretation down to the local level that is easy to deal with in terms of developing adaptation plans. So we kind of I have envision this is like if you look at a 200, 200 kilometer pixel over the top of San Francisco Bay, it covers a lot of central California, not just San Francisco Bay. And if we even look down at what's been done as downscaling by K and it all to 150 uh, kilometer square pixel, it, it encompasses kind of the overall Bay Area, but it's still not typically how we manage when you look at the actual 40 by 40 kilometer, we're starting to get to parts of the Bay, in this case, the north San Francisco Bay and Central part uh, overlaying San Francisco. And then as you go down to actually a, a more like a uh, smaller frame of just part of a bay of 10 by 10 kilometers, now you're starting to get to the range that is managed together or with a select group of managers. And finally, if we get a few kilometers, then we're looking at Corte Madera Marsh that's managed by California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And that particular agency then has responsibility for this. It's a cohesive management plan. And as you go into the marsh itself, and look at uh, usually what's less than a kilometer square in fragments in this urbanized estuary, then you're talking about the level at which we think measurement uh, is important to do in some of these areas to try to understand the problem. And in this case, we usually go down to a pixel size of 25 by 25 meters on having better understanding in our models of elevation, tidal range, and vegetation. So this is kind of the overview, is we're looking at elevation models vegetation surveys associated with the elevations of where plants are, the dynamics of sediment, logging the tidal ranges, and recording local weather patterns to adjust the larger models to produce uh, effects or impact models. And we separate sea level rise models, which are a little bit simpler, from storm impacts models, which are more difficult because it's harder to get kind of the frequency rates of these storms in, into these models. So just kind of walk through the phases briefly is that, you know, our baseline conditions have helped us at least establish what we're dealing with out there originally. And our biggest uh, friend in this case is the RTK GPS uh, mapping. And we've chosen this because of the resolution of, of one to two centimeters within a, a relatively small marsh area. And we can go ahead and, and uh, get our uh, healthy and hail volunteers to, and uh, technicians to go out and march through these areas and get hundreds to thousands of points and get a real good coverage that is accurate to within a centimeter or two because the main point is that a lot of species response will be in that fine of a change. 
And in fact, a lot of our marshes across them, there's a 40 centimeter change at maximum between the low end and the high end. So what we're seeing is that this type of habitat has low variation to begin with. If the instrumentation you use is not fine enough, you'll miss the potential for change affecting the habitat types and the species using them because you don't have the resolution you need. And one example of this is in our Corte Madera marsh work, we did work on RTK GPS and compared it to a LIDAR coverage, which is very good for broader scale and works well in areas with low vegetation. But in marshes in San Francisco Bay where there is relatively dense vegetation, we found that the average error was 23 centimeters, and that's a projected change in sea level rise in San Francisco Bay from 2012 to 2040 or 2050. So in, in general, 30, 40 years, the error is as high as the change we project. So that's why we think that we need higher resolution to look locally at these parcels and that when you have vegetation, you have to really be careful to account for that in use of uh, LIDAR data, which we still use in, in broader projects. Um, but in terms of water level monitoring, we try to do something simple. We're trying to do just low high tide tracks through time to get a better idea in a particular parcel what the tidal range has been. And to do that, we're using uh, simple uh, hobo or Solent's water level loggers, and we use RTK GPS to get the elevations on them so we can adjust to any VD88 datum or tidal datum, either one. So that's helpful at least to uh, register the models relative to inundation rates. And at the same time we do these surveys, the staff in the field are doing vegetation uh, measurements, both on elevation of the vegetation and species composition. So we're able to give a better idea of what is the elevation range where we're seeing particular communities because we expect that community transition is one of the features we will see first as changes in sea level and storm events happen. So here's an example of our mapping from our marshes in San Francisco Bay, and this is an array of the 12 marshes that we have, and they, in the middle has the pictures of the different marshes in different colors, but in general you can see them at mean tide level, most of them are green, meaning vegetation, and very few have inundation at that point, which is in the blue, uh, bottom one down number 10 at the bottom has blue, and that means it's inundated. But when you get to uh, mean high water, then you'll see that like half the marshes are completely inundated or uh, significantly inundated, while the other half have various levels depending on how high they are. So elevation models suggest that this is the current condition of what's going on. And of course, when you go to mean higher high water, very high tides, then most of them are inundated almost 100% with a few marshes that have these, uh, we call them refugia areas that are above mean higher high water. So what we're trying to do with these meters is downscale within each of these marshes along creeks. And we've simplified this uh, more recently because it takes a lot of effort to get these loggers to work in, in some of these conditions. And, and so we've tried to do it by putting it down to that system I mentioned before of kind of a single mo monitor in the front of the marsh and, and one up a channel in the marsh to look at the chart. And just briefly on this thing, we're looking at water level going up and down in the uh, vertical axis, horizontal axis, just through time. And the bigger uh, blue line that's going up and down the most, that's the Golden Gate, the tide gauge, the oldest one on the West Coast. And all the other ones are showing the truncation that we're seeing within the marsh plane to tell you already that there are differences when you go to any particular marsh of delays from the Golden Gate, and, and those are accounted for it by using the loggers. So uh, the question I was asked about the sediment and hydro it has been pretty challenging. I'm an ecologist from background, and I've had to do a lot of crossover work with our hydrologists here in the California Water Science Center and learn a lot about uh, the importance of, of trying to get this measured to better understand the habitat values. So this is something that we've been doing, and the methods have varied quite a bit depending on the particular study and the particular data sets that we're using to model with. So a lot of people use sediment cores and dating, uh, lead dating or cesium dating, to assess the, the accretion on the marsh plane that includes organic matter. Surface uh, elevation tables, they're very heavily used 
and uh, they deployed long term and allows for leveling of exactly how the marsh is going up, and it takes a lot of effort. But we are trying to employ these on every one of our marshes that we're we're uh, we're working on, and it's quite a quite an effort. But we think then starting this long term record will be really important to help people uh, get an idea of how much uh, sediment is accreting in the marsh plain, and we are on some cases able to find historic data sets of elevation of marshes. And in that case, you can just do subtraction and get at least 10 years of data, maybe you know up to 20. Before that, there are very few technological um, efforts to try to measure this finely, but we can look at the actual change on the marsh plane and try to use that as from now into the future if we think that it's representative of change that's going on or a sediment that's being accreted on the marsh, we can use those levels to, to project into the future. So there are different methods, um, a lot of different variation there, and certainly one of the challenges we're having is trying to do this with better understanding of how sediment settles out in mudflats and marshes and the effects that storms have on the bathtub effect of, of the sediment pool and where the sediment ends up. So this is one of our our biggest efforts that we're working uh, in combination with uh, uh, hydrologists uh, at Water Science Centers on. So taking that information, what we're trying to do is build whether there's accretion models that also occur besides just adding water to surface models that allow us to look at inundation rates to make sure that we understand the level to which a marsh can keep up compared to that the elevation increase is not keeping up. So this integrated application, we're trying to answer the question of, for a particular wetland, uh, will it drown? And what's the final inundation pattern? Can the species be changed? Can we determine how the vegetation or habitat will shift? And so we're looking at these individual marshes and trying to provide the information through a modeling process. And this particular one uh, is adapted from this Marsh 98 uh, models and um, by Morris as well as John Calloway's work of looking at uh, both above ground uh, productivity and inputs as well as uh, below ground effects. And trying to do the sea level rise curve, picking one of the modest curves in the middle to use and look at productivity across differences in elevation of the plants as well as the sediment input from the organic matter as well as the mineral content from the water. So putting that together into one model, we're trying to estimate out whether we can project and see if these uh, these models provide answers to where we think there'll be low areas and high areas in the future, and we'll show a couple of show a couple examples of, of what that looks like in the future that we think we can project. So I'm not sure this will run. Let's see if oh it did. I guess can you see this? I'm not sure if you're all seeing a video. Yeah, I am. Yes. Okay, so it sometimes doesn't come across well, but this is an example from China Camp, a state park in the north part of San Francisco Bay. Uh, that is one of the oldest marshes in this area, and so it's heavily researched, uh, and it is a NOAA National Estuarine Research Reserve. So we've modeled this to look at it with our survey methods, and what we're showing on the top level is the surface elevation map and mean higher water compared to mean sea level. And as you look through time, when we model through time using the sea level rise projections, we're able to show where the mean higher water will be. It exceeds the vegetation very early on through time because through every tide soak it's inundated, but even mean lower water is drowning the marsh in our projections by 2090. So in this particular case, and this includes accretion, so in this particular case what we're able to show is that you'll get mean higher water, high, more increased inundations of the vegetation starting relatively early in a few decades, but by 2090, our projection is that most of the marsh is mudflat. It is gone. And that is the potential if most of our calculations are correct, which is why we've had a lot of discussion about this of whether we're measuring the sediment correctly and getting the accretion properly measured. So I think that's one of the key parts, although the end thing is that we are following the IPCC models of sea level rise and storms, and those particular uh, values will always now be dependent on how many of these global climate change models are being run and come into agreement. So I'll say there a really important factor is that, you know, the the biggest model of all, the climate change model, still 
runs the and determines whether or not we can get a local response model to work right. It has to be correct at the bigger scale, although I think to a great extent we, we at least feel we're in the, the ballpark of what the estimates believe, and that is good enough to tell us a lot about already what adaptation will look like. So for <clears throat> San Pablo Refuge in North Bay, it has a lot of listed species of concern and different habitat types. One of our biggest issues is looking at this area relative to what then is the habitat left for these species. And so looking at this particular projection of mean elevation, mean, mean sea level, with through time running this model or this type of model, we can actually show in, in kind of a, a schematic of every decade. So every 10 years is showing on a couple of the different uh, pieces of the uh, San Pablo uh, refuge properties. And if you look at the green, it's vegetation. And as it turns to yellow and to orange in the pictures, that means that it's becoming denuded by increased inundation. And finally, when you get to the kind of the reddish brown color, the brown means mud. So basically, that's why our projections are already suggesting that we expect uh, that these particular areas, given the current projections of sea level rise, will be inundated fully with less of vegetation that won't be able to survive that level of inundation in the range of 2050 to 2090. So this, of course, has not been good news for the refuges, um, although it is pointed out that the particular aspect of it is that there's a linear increase to 2050, roughly, of just about 20 centimeters. And then from there, we go exponential. And that's why you, there's some time here of the first horizon of 30 to 40 years where any kind of resilience that you can build into the system, you have time to do, because after that point, it's going to be much quicker uh, change based on the forecast models. So at least... Uh, yeah, and this is Bill. I have a question. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, so, um, what's known about the relationship between the rate of uh, sedimentation and the um, amount of inund inundation uh, on a particular spot? I mean, I mean, is there any reason to think that the past um, uh, sedimentation rate will change with if, if, the, if the sea level is rising and increased inundation at a given site? Yeah, exactly. So that that's a good question, Bill. I mean, in terms of what we're trying to find out is a little bit more about the sediment processes going on, because although they're typically done by the hydrologists at a, a bay level or a ocean to bay level, there's very like there's fewer studies that are looking really closely at how sediment drops out into marshes, and so there, we're working with uh, two studies. One is kind of locally at trying to do bottle studies of sediment and look at variation through time of when does sediment come down. In, in California, in the south, the Mediterranean climate, it's, it's oftentimes just the winter and only during a few storm events. Right. In other areas, it's either river flow events related to snow melt or and um, the wintering period that's more extensive and has a lot more of the sediment deposition than does the summer period. So we're trying to look at that difference in seasonality and try to see if we can understand relative to storm events coming more in the winter, if that deposits in a different way. So the, the best hydrologic models that are done for these types of systems are by Delft, um, the Delft models that are um, done uh, extensively for places like San Francisco Bay, and they are trying to build into their models the ability to look at sediment deposition from the mudflat into the tidal marsh because they're not exclusive of each other. If the tidal marsh starts to, to be uh, inundated, erosion will occur that will put it into a mudflat state. So the mud that's on the marsh goes into the mudflat. Or if the marsh is staying above, the mud from the uh, mudflat goes up to the marsh. Right. And so that, that is not, I don't believe there's a single model that has done that very well, of looking at the relationship between a flat and the adjacent marsh. And that's part of our effort to do some of these basic studies and get to that point of whether those models can help to make sure that we're not making a mistake at this. And I think the biggest difference on a lot of the historic studies that are core studies, and you're talking about hundreds of thousands of years uh, looking at the change rates, is that the speed of this change, of course, is, is very quick. You're talking a, a century. Right. And because right. of that, there's most people, I believe, are still of the mind that it's very hard to see how processes 
would still allow marsh to keep up. And I think that's from our existing data of what sediment looks like now and how we think it drops out, it's clear that no, it doesn't keep up. Right. So, so I'll, I guess I'll, I'll leave that as a thought, and I'm sure that can be a discussion point too. It is definitely a major point, but this is the result that that caused some uh, con con concerns here. Although I think it's it's pretty uh, uh, straightforward when you look at three three feet to four feet of, of uh, sea level rise in, by 2100. Is that when we looked at the results, the three marshes only uh, had uh, uh, five percent of the area was surviving by 2100. And so the, the refuge you had at the time isn't the refuge you'll have in 2100. And so were, were all these systems bounded pretty well by a topographic shift at the upper edge? There wasn't so any typically migration? In, in, like in this case, there's a highway on the edge. Yeah. And so that's uh, one of the example points of there's no marsh migration uh, areas. There's no areas to go upstream and, and have a, a pushing up, and that's very common in urbanized areas like San Francisco Bay. Yeah, so right. I think that that's another uh, part of the overall discussion of of how to look at the problem of sea level rise and, and storm events of what is the surroundings to the parcel you're managing. Yeah. And that's something that is a little bit of a shift in thinking, right? So it is definitely one of the areas that we're trying to keep looking at. I'll, I'll do a little bit on vertebrates. Uh, it's, again, part of the, the sensitivity of vertebrates helps us to look at the change. Uh, and either we'll see distributional changes, survival differences of individuals, or productivity declines in, in some species where they are having reproductive problems with nesting birds or mammals that are, are inundated more than they used to be and are able, unable to reproduce. Part of the work we've been doing is trying to actually do surveys of these listed species and look at the predation rates during the, the inundation events. And just as an example, this California clap rail data on the left-hand side, you'll see a little red dot. That red uh, cone is the locations of birds at high tide. And the blue cone is at low tide, how it spreads out into the rest of the marsh foraging on the, the resources in the channels. So you can see kind of that one of the key factors is these refugia, these small areas that are higher elevation where animals can go when the tide comes up. So we think that's a key factor in management for the future is understanding those areas and looking to manage for them in a positive sense. And includes the, you, you can see the buildings in the background, right? There's here's a housing. You know, this is a, a factory complex behind a, a, a marsh, and you'll have to, you know, be aware that the edge of that area is important. It's not. It's not. Uh, an area that is is just an un, unfriendly neighbor. It's it's going to be where the animals are climbing up to, to try to survive as the water comes up. Mm -hmm. So I think John, that, John, that yeah, I could ask you to to try to wrap up if you yes, I will. Is is um, especially as it relates to the work at Bandon, if if you are doing yep work related to critters at Bandon. Okay. Yep, I'll, I'll provide a couple examples, two more examples on the invertebrates, and I'll talk about the adaptation for that with the last photos being of abandoned maps we just finished. Sorry, we, yeah, we're just running out of time a little bit here, so i okay. to manage that. All right, uh, so I'll just mention briefly then the parts we're studying include survival of animals, reproduction of nesting birds, and this 40-year study in Europe actually showed how much species already have been affected uh, through time of, of there's more flooding events going on, so more loss of individual nests through time. And for our studies locally, when we look at marsh plain and and look specifically at where birds are using habitat, a lot of it's on the edge. These are home ranges that are very small already from California to Black Rail. And when we look at the change in the elevations of the marsh relative to what currently inundation does, it's these refugia zones that are so important. So that's uh, the main point. We'll be looking at this modeling it hopefully to try to get a better idea of how viable populations will be through time because in the end, that's sort of one of the concerns in this area of a lot of endangered species. So for the abandoned marsh, for example, have you picked the species that you'll be focusing on? No, and so one of the things we're working with Oregon State, so our uh, one of our biologists is now a PhD student with Bruce Duggar, and that's uh, Kevin Buffington, and he is looking at water birds as an example of species that are affected in a whole flyway sense, because all the different areas of shoals that are adjacent to these marshes are used by water birds all the way up the flyway. And so we're trying to 
kind of put that into a modeling sense of if these areas start to change a lot, what is the like a future of, of changing in that? So let me wander past this. We can come back to it on what are the options and changes. I know that will be an important topic later, but this kind of is a, a, a – I'll go by the summary. Uh, so this is the number of studies we've got in our project, our, our 14 to 15 sites that extend down the coast from Padilla Bay all the way down to Tijuana Slough. And I'll just show a couple images of this, the marshes we're talking about. This is Willapa Bay and its point data that we just completed this year of looking at the differences in the marsh elevations. And so we can kind of show the gradient, model that with the digital elevation model, and kind of show the levels at which here's the high zones in the back that are seemingly quite important for future and also for species survival in the low areas in the mudflats and adjacent to them, as well as the amount of inundation of what's below mean sea level, what's above, and what's above higher high uh, water, of which in this case there's very little. Um, similar to Bandon, and I'll end with this one, Bandon has the point data here showing how we've kind of gone through it and, and gotten this information. Here's the digital elevation model showing the, the Elevations going from 1.4 to 3 meters, and finally inundation models of where what's below mean higher water, what's above mean mean higher high water, and so which areas of the marsh are having experiencing that rates of inundation. So applying these models, I think, provides a local look and a, a way to respond with planning at a parcel-based or management manager-based level. And I think it's something that also leads into future understanding of following this and getting some baselines so you can kind of like move forward and have representative sites you can follow and say, are these models holding true 10 years from now, you know, 20 years from now, because we measured them once and, and we'll follow up and do so at a few places through time. So that's our hope that this provides baseline information and a way to look at change as we kind of go into this future uh, where there's higher sea levels and more storm events. So uh, hopefully that wasn't too long on finishing. So I guess, uh, yeah, if there's questions about our approaches and uh, where we're at, uh, happy to chat about that. Yeah, let's open it up for questions for five minutes or so. so. Hello, John. This is uh, Eric Mailbrecht. Um, uh, and you're getting started uh, in the Bandon area, which is wonderful. Um, and as you know, we're kind of undertaking a, 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 a a first stab at a vulnerability assessment for the larger estuary area. And I'm wondering if, I mean, you've developed a, a kind of methodology based on um, quite a bit of uh, field work and some technology and modeling um, capacity. I'm wondering if you have recommendations for doing similar type approaches kind of with lower tech and uh, kind of lower data density um, resources. Sure. I, I think that, you know, there's different ways to, uh, do this, and in terms of the the good part is the technology was beyond our reach, except about five years ago, and that a lot of the technology has come down in price. It's still not cheap. The RTK GPS units about twenty five thousand dollars overall, but you can get them for less than that. And a lot of these things have changed. So I still think that from a, a broader regional viewpoint, having this equipment is valuable. We we have one unit at Nisqually Refuge that. We use for restoration work there to, to have better measurement. The refuge does use it, use it for looking at infrastructure, and uh, it has been valuable. But you certainly can do it with rentals, leveling mm -hmm. tools, and if you don't use that, you can just go to standard survey gear. Yeah, okay. Um, and and uh, certainly that's it, – it's certainly not that bad. It, it certainly has some issues on uh, how much you have to know. So to us – we're able to <laughs> yes. train people relatively quickly in RTK GPS, and we, you know, there are some things you have to know uh, to make sure you don't make too many errors. But in general, it uh, is pretty simple to use and provides high level of resolution. Well, given, um, and that's good to know, thank you. And I guess given that, you know, the, the availability of LIDAR elevation data um, and the error ranges you're discovering, and I, I, I've, I've seen several other researchers coming up with those same kind of similar results, um, do you think it's even worthwhile trying to do kind of larger and cruder resolution, resolution work using even LIDAR and other existing data sets like that? I think it's it has to do with what is your main point. Okay. And so that in our case, we were driven by the understanding of endangered species with relatively narrow, narrow elevation 
ranges mm-hmm. that we, if we didn't get that, we kind of would be uh, not able to do the predictions correctly. So I guess I would say well, I felt we had to do it. Now, mm-hmm. if you do a broader view, I, I think it's fine for especially a regional look that mm-hmm. uh, using that type of level of error is okay. But we we kind of encourage people to try to get it down to a finer level and, and look a little closer just because these habitats are typically just not that great in elevation variation. So Very you just true. keep missing the, the – the, you, you can't explain your variation because you didn't measure it fine enough. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I have a question about the future work, if I may. Sure. Um, there was the map showing uh, 14 or 15 uh, systems um, at, uh, along the west coast, and I was, and I, I'm sure those those represent decisions um, to do work in those systems. I was curious if you put that vetting process through uh, the question of uh, looking at different estuary types, uh, uh, sort of geomorphological types, to um, in the end, be able to draw conclusions about river dominated or ocean dominated or lagoonal systems and and the like. And the answer is unfortunately no. Okay. And part of it is that selection of sites had to do with where we knew we could get the work done and have existing support or ongoing uh, data collection that we are already doing. Yeah. And okay. I think that that is the kind of the next steps as we get this look across variation. Then we go back to more detail on the factors that are causing the variation, for example, like those different types of systems. So we're trying to pick and choose from our sites. And right now we're working with Neil Ganju, who is at uh, Woods Hole in uh, Massachusetts, and doing East Coast work uh, similarly. And so he came from Sacramento Water Office for USGS, and he's doing our work on looking at these hydrologic models that we hope will give us sediment balances, sediment Uh, budgets. uh And we're trying to do... A uh, riverine influenced estuary, our, our current one is at Seal Beach, which is not. It's basically just a storm event estuary with very little uh, watershed input. Mm-hmm. And we're going to switch then to another one with more watershed input, and we hope then we'll follow that with a couple that are very highly influenced by riverine input. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, thank you, John. Sure. So we probably need to to move on to our next presentation. Thank you, John. You bet. And um, so, so hey, how do you, this is this is Martin. Hey, Martin. Hey, so how do you give control to me? How do I? I will, uh, this is a magic wand thing, right? Thing. Yeah, so okay. <laughs> Hold on. Let me do. Let me find you here. Okay. All right. Um, should be seeing something pop up on your screen. So Martin, at this point, uh, you should have control by uh, going to the share menu it's on the top left part of your screen and okay. clicking in share my desktop. And uh, we need to pick my monitor too. Yeah, there we go. We are transitioning to your screen. Okay. The title slide there. Looks good out here. Yeah. All right, there we go. So, uh, our cat, are you with me too? I sure am. Hey, all right. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And pardon me, I have a cold, and and don't worry. Uh, we don't. We have very preliminary data, so we can get you out of here pretty soon. As a matter of fact. <laughs> but um, my name is Martin LaFrance. I'm a geomorphologist up here at Portland State, and uh, Kathy Rivera is an ecologist working with us on this project. Is where Sarah Epley, who's a biologist, and we're looking at this idea about these shifting habitat mosaics. So similar to what everybody's looking for, trying to you know get some sense about um, how these habitats will change with sea level rise, and our sort of take on it is thinking in terms of rates, and at, at really kind of a very fine scale is the idea. And our thinking going into this is that uh, you know sea level rise is likely to outpace soil formation processes. So we don't know a lot about subaqueous soils, but we know that they um, form you know, moderately rapidly, a little faster than terrestrial soils. But you know, this is the substrate for um, plants and fauna in these marshes. So there has to be some biogeochemical changes that take place, as well as accretion rates that keep up and all these sorts of things. 
So, you know, we had this idea, you know, sea level rise, it, it, it may, depending on the rate of sea level rise, create these sort of extensive networks of different habitats. So something that we're not used to seeing because the rate of sea level rise is outpacing the endemic species in that particular area. Um, so we are working this notion of sort of the soil plant fauna feedback, and I do the soil stuff, and the cat is out there digging up clams, and uh, Sarah's laying out transects, and what we're, you know, these salt marsh plants and animals, so they modify the sediment, morphological, hydrological processes of the marsh, as we know, but, at, you know, at very fine scales, and at rates that we don't necessarily understand. Um, so, There's one thing I want to say about that last one, too. Oh, go ahead. Go back. Just, um, a lot of what people do know about marshes is based on East Coast marshes. That's why the pictures in the Oh, right, right. I mean, say this. So, uh, um, a bunch of the work that's been done in uh, individual studies and also in meta-analysis is pretty much saying, well, the marshes should be able to keep pace, but that's really based on having uh, common cord grass, Bartina alterniflora in the system and having these vast extenses uh, of low marsh with this Bartina. And we don't have that here. The two places we did, we've been eradicating, which is good. But, um, and therefore, the system probably will be quite a bit different uh, on this coast, and still there's these interactions between the um, this animals that affect primary productivity with their grazing, with their oxygenating the soil and adding nutrients to it, so they're affecting both the soil and the plants in that way. The plants, of course, are slowing flow and increasing deposition of sediments and, and adding the organic substrate. So, um, so those types of processes are still going on, but they're going to go on at completely different rates than in the East Coast uh, Spartina-dominated marshes. Okay, back Great. to you. Thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's why it's a team effort because I don't know anything. Yeah. Um, but again, yeah. So a lot of the East Coast Gulf, you know, they have really high accretion rates, a lot of organic matter, and a lot of our marshes, the accretion rates are often more dominated by sediment. And how much of that is land use? How much of that is actually um, the way these marshes work. So we took, what we're doing is we're taking advantage of these dike removals, sort of an opportunistic approach here to say, you know, clearly you remove a dike, you inundate um, an area that had been diked for some decades, and clearly that, that rate of inundation is faster than sea level rise, but still it's, it's sort of a natural laboratory to look at how these soils will be responding to changes in their hydrologic regime. So uh, the first site here is Bandon and Nelestin. If you're familiar with them, of course, the Nelestin is the one that's been restored with the dike removed. And this is just a snapshot of the DEM for the area, um, similar to what we just saw here shortly ago. Um, and then what we did is we established these transects. So this is the Nelestin transect, and then, of course, the Bandon transect. And our goal here was, again, a very fine scale. We wanted to look at changes in elevation of about 10 centimeters. So moving along the transect, this is turning around and looking backward in the Bandon Marsh, and this is kind of the high, this is the highest point in Bandon, kind of the high marsh vegetation. And looking the other direction, and that's Sarah there um, marking off stakes. And very simply, to answer another question about cheaper <laughs> methods, we use a rotating laser level. It costs about $1,000, has about a 300 meter range, but it has you know, better than centimeter accuracy. So actually in the field, as we lay the transect, we just walk along with the laser detector, and every 10 centimeter drop in elevation, we establish a, a transect, or we establish um, sampling at that point. And we take a soil sample, um, actually two sections from zero to three centimeters and three to six centimeters, and then we also sample for uh, fauna, and then laying out um, Quadrat. yeah, quadrants. <laughs> to do whatever they're doing over there. Um, so, and then the idea, so we've got vegetation, we've got that information, and we have some of the data that we can talk about now as some of the soil data. Oh, one more thing analyzed. though, so for each of these, we oh, have sure. um, replicates at each of the elevations, every 10 centimeters, um, at random distances from our transect. And one thing we were sure to do is in every sampling spot, we uh, we made sure that we had the soil data, the infauna data, and the vegetation data, and the height. So we know exactly what is at a spot and how inundated that spot should be. 
Okay. Great. And so, and so we can start to look at some of this. Um, so just two plots here. So this is oxidation reduction potential um, against pH, and they should be inversely related. You should have higher ORP associated. Um, and, and it works, but of course the Nelestin unit has a different slope, it has a different spread of the data, and actually the values are higher, closer to 400 as opposed to 200, so it's indicative that um, it had or oxidation processes for those decades, and so in the year or so that it's been inundated, it's beginning to go through reduction processes, but clearly the soils um, are not as reduced as the reference marsh at this point. So what we can say is that at least with this level of inundation over a year or so, we don't we haven't reached um, an ORP that is as similar to uh, an actual salt marsh in this case. And then this is ORP against elevation, and actually my axes I uh, got them turned around there. Sorry about that. But um, so ORP is higher at higher elevations. Oh wait, yeah. Uh, so, and let me say what this is. The twenty is. Uh, these don't make sense necessarily. It's just how we took our data. Don't make sense to the viewer <laughs> right away. We'll change that. But 20 is our lowest part, so that's not high elevation. That is um, pretty much oh, mid the... to low intertidal. It was um, about two feet above mean lower lower wa water. And right. then the zero on the relative tidal elevation axis is, axis is our highest point, and so it's about two meters higher than that. Okay, back to you, Martin. So the Okay so, okay, so this is along that transect, um, and in this case, uh, relative to elevation, you know, you have a much tighter uh, fit to the model, uh, at least to this relationship, at the lower elevation in the restored marsh. So the areas in the restored marsh that are being inundated more often, obviously, are responding more quickly than areas that haven't been, that aren't being flooded, so they're higher elevation. And again, we can start to, as much as best as possible, to start thinking about that in terms of sea level rise and amount of inundation or hours of inundation annually, which is where we're going next um, with this data. Um, same thing, just looking at pH, uh, tend to be more acidic, excuse me, um, at higher elevations, which is again what you'd expect, but the spread is larger. And then also notice that in the Nelestin unit, you have these really low pH values. So these are areas where after the diking took place, you had the formation of acid sulfate soils. So typical pH is in you know, the order of 2.5 to 4, something in that neighborhood. So the question is how long until we sort of restore more common salt marsh pH in those particular environments. Um, you want to take this, Kat? Um, sure. So this is Sarah's data. She had to go to class to teach. But um, she, uh, as I said, was putting out quadrats, one meter square quadrats, um, replicate ones at each of these elevations, and looked at the number of plants and which plants they were, so both community composition and species richness, um, in these quadrats at these two marsh units in um, the refuge. And you can see that um, the, at Bandon, there's about twice as many plants, marsh, uh, salt marsh plants, compared to the Nylestin unit with, you know, just over four per quadrat uh, in Bandon and only about two in Nylestin. And then, next slide, uh, what's kind of interesting is how this changes across tidal elevation. And again, th this is our quadrat numbering, not um, how high it is on the x-axis, so that 20 is our low point and zero is our high point. And so you can see that in Bandon follows the trajectory one would expect with the greatest diversity up um, in the higher marsh, and then diversity fairly linearly dropping off as you go down towards the uh, low intertidal zone. Uh, the Nylestin unit, however, has no pattern really, or if there is one, it's parabolic. And um, <laughs> the low is kind of where you'd expect it to be that there's, you know, in the lower intertidal, there's not many species. And then that's increasing, fairly similar to Bandon. Uh, towards the mid, but once you get to the high marsh, that's r actually really low plant diversity again. Um, whether that's because the acidity of the soil, or um, uh, or that that was sort of a wetland area because there's re canary grass there, so there was it's not fully dry. It was clearly some freshwater input um, when it was diked, 
And, and so, but there you see this great drop off due to the transition in, in communities over time. And then the real question is, well, how quickly is that going to be able to respond to this new inundation regime? And uh, both from the soils, what Martin's already been looking at and talking about, that's just some of our soil measures, as well as the plant community and then the invert community as well. And um, unfortunately, it takes a long time to sort through the invertebrate data, so I don't have those to show you yet. Hey, Kat, but, um, was the upper end of that uh, canalistin transect? Uh huh. Was the upper end of that in that sluice edge and sluice edge? Uh, pretty it? close to it, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, Martin, want to point it out on your? Yeah, it looks like you're on right. the on the the you band in transect. The sluice edge and into the woods a little bit there. On the the, the nalestin, we got right up, right up to there was a really abrupt change to poison oak, <laughs> or something like that. No, there's no poison out there, but yeah, yeah that that was, nice. I, I know what you mean. Okay, good, thanks. Um, again, not not plant specialty, but <laughs> let's see. These are sea level rise, accretion, and and soils guy, and water flow. So then we're doing we're doing similar stuff uh, at Willapa. Um, so this is the Willapa area that we saw earlier, and the the red lines are the current dikes. And this back line is a sub-dike that won't be removed, but this forward dike will be removed. And actually, the dikes that traverse around to the east have already uh, somewhat been removed. So we've, oh, and there's Dan Usman, <laughs> who used to help us with this project, but disappeared on us. But, um, so we do use GPS, but in this case, mostly to get uh, horizontal precision down to about 10 centimeters or so. And then we use the laser level to kind of rapidly survey the area for uh, Elevation changes. So we only have the DEM, uh, the DEM stops as you go out into the salt marsh itself. But this again are the transects. And what's sort of remarkable to me about this is, of course, the red area is the highest elevation. So actually, almost the entire diked area in Willapa is at a lower elevation than the high marsh next to the dike. So that will be awfully exciting when that dike comes out to see how these uh, soils transition beyond that particular point. And actually, that's about it. So, yeah. so that's where we are at this point. And again, we're still running soil data. And the idea is to create that plant soil fauna feedback to get some sense about the resi both resilience of terrestrial organisms to sea level rise, and then you know the rates of change that you might expect um, with some of these uh, more with the marsh species. Great. Anything to close with, Kat? No, that's pretty much it. Other than we're also looking at extending this to some sites in Coos Bay. There's two sites we're looking at that are going to have the dike removals to again use as a proxy for sea level rise with a change in inundation scheme. And um, and then also South Slough um, at the National Estuarine Research Reserve there. Their marsh is just a different topography altogether. And so we're really interested in that and working with the um, South Slough folks on that. So we actually applied this morning for a grant to do that. Great. So, well, let's open it up for questions, yeah, yeah, and discussion. So I have one. I can say, Kat, um, did you, I, know, I think you've been in touch with Ben Horton at Penn State and the, uh, the people that are doing the uh, uh, foraminifera work. Yeah, um, we sure have. Yeah. Is that, is that uh, those data help to you interpreting some of these? Or I think it's actually the other way around. It looks like some of that chemistry might relate to what they're finding with the Yeah. At this point, we've talked about collaborating, and we both we both groups have liked that idea, and we have took uh, taken some samples for them at the Willapa unit, um, and that's as far as we've gotten because we you know we made these graphs pretty much today. Okay. An hour and a half ago, so we haven't had a chance to share them with him yet. Yeah, that, I'd be interested to hear their reaction because I, they just got some new graphs uh, two days ago, I think, on on some of the uh, foraminifera information they've got, where they're where they starting to see at some of our lower sites some of the marine foraminifera show up uh, finally after well after about starting at about four months after inundation and then beyond that and gradually to the more the higher sites. Um, and I'm wondering how much that that's affected by the 
chemistry uh, parameters you have. Yeah, it will be really interesting as we uh, both groups track this over time to see that change. And unfortunately, we didn't start as early as they did. But one yeah. thing we did notice that we forgot to say before is that when we were in the, um, in the Leston unit, the one with the dike removal, we were, um, you know, standing on red sediment that r right under it was um, black, and so it was completely anoxic, right. and looking entirely inhospitable, but then there's a flock of uh, shorebirds feeding right there, and we, you know, sampled some opportunistically there, and indeed there were amphipods right living there that were there feeding on, and they were actually tracking them really easily because the amphipods, when they burrowed, they'd bring up the um, grayish and black sediment up to the surface, and so there, it was like this great visual cue as to where they were burrowing on top of the, um, the rusty soils. And so the birds were foraging right. very effectively there, and I was I was surprised because it was almost all the way up the transect. So we were sort of in uh, getting into high marsh there. Um, yeah, well, it was a little yeah. lower than mid marsh, and um, and just to see that already there was this recovery of the in fauna and the birds using the area was surprising for me. Yeah, me too. I've been seeing that too. That's great. Hey, this is Chris. I have the other. A question for both. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. Okay. Yeah, I had a question for both presenters. I was just curious if um, if anybody was looking at carbon content and um, of of the soils and vegetation in in the areas they're sampling and how that might change over time. Well, we're doing so. There's the whole suite of chemicals. We're doing organic matter, so mm -hmm. it's not the total carbon, but it's you know a decent proxy at least for what we can do. Well, we've got the pH or the carbon sequestration and, and how, how these processes might affect that. Um, yeah, no, I mean, that, that would certainly be interesting. And, and to that extent, we, uh, you know, we sample this transect, and then I go back with a soil core, a meter and a half soil core uh, that you saw a picture of, actually. And then I go down about a meter and a half and subsample that at 10 centimeter intervals. So we've got the organic matter distribution going down about a minute and a half, and then about a meter and a half, and all the same things, pH kind of their salinity, um, texture, and all that good stuff. And what's interesting to me is in both of these areas, in the areas that were diked, when we go down deep at about 60 to, 70, 60 to 70 centimeters depth, you really can't tell the difference between the area that was diked and the area that was never diked. So, you know, how the soils dried out and how they changed was down to a depth of about 60 or 70 centimeters. So whatever that might imply about future inundation rates is at least interesting. Okay. Thank you. Hi, this is Eric. I've got a question around kind of time scales. Um, and I think the one, the, the one question is how long has it been since the, the dikes have been removed at the abandoned marsh sites? That happened in August of, the, of 2011. Of 2011. Okay, so it's been a year and a half or so. Okay. It was about a year when we got in there, yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, and then uh, in your last little point about, you know, if you go down 60 centimeters, um, soil differences are, are minimal between the dikes and non-diked areas. But I, and I guess that's reflecting back on this area being all nine, but non-diked long ago um, is very similar down there. But from a transition point of view and kind of a, a how that community adapts, just ballpark, and also from the literature, since I don't know this well, what do you think that you know the transition time would be for the sites to actually come into, I guess, equilibrium from a soil point of view and from a plant point of view, to the non-diked areas? Um, well, that's a great question. <laughs> I mean, part of it is that the it seems like for the soils point that hasn't really been looked at before, hmm. and so I mean that's part of. In the NSF grant we're writing, that's one of the things we're pointing out that the the whole formation of subaqueous soils um, has been really um, overlooked for a long time, and so in the rates of which that happened, that's mm -hmm. correct, right, Martin? Yeah, and the, the only thing I have to inform it with is a, a different hat I wear is I do a soil analysis in uh, areas where there's been a dam removal, so it's kind of the inverse of this. You remove the dam, drain the reservoir. Mm -hmm. and then the soils begin to oxidize through time. And what I found there is five years after a dam removal, the soils have essentially, um, we say they ripened, and they've ripened to a depth of about 50 or 60 centimeters. So 
kind of physical changes like water content are uh, the same as you would see in an upland soil, but everything else is nowhere close. If the soils are still reduced, at elevated organic matter, elevated nitrates. So I expect it to be the same kind of thing that these, you know, these processes are just going to take a lot longer. And so the question is, can with it, with ever, whatever the inundation regime is, what plants and fauna will be able to take advantage of that newly inundated area if the mm -hmm. substrate hasn't kept up? So. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm getting at, because I think John earlier, you know, the question around, okay, these areas don't have a boundary or hold, hard wall against, so there could be a migration of an up in elevation um, as these marshes hopefully move inland with sea level rise. And the question is, can the communities keep up with that rate of change? And of course, it's a function of elevation too, but that's just kind of a core question I'm curious about. Yeah, and, and then yeah. the one, the sort of quali qualitative thing of us being out there is seeing how resilient the terrestrial species are yeah. um, in that kind of high marsh in the western. I'd like to throw in another question or point in, into this very uh, discussion. I'm, I'm first of all glad to see somebody doing some work on subaqueous soils in the northwest. This has always been um, it intrigued me as a way, as a way to uh, understand the systems better. But I uh, have your cores samples gotten to a place that you can almost definitively say represents the 1700 um, subduction zone earthquake and tsunami along the Oregon coast? Yeah, that's that's my favorite question right there. <laughs> um, in Willapa, we've hit it several times. Okay, but it's, not, there's not a, in Bandon. There's a, no, but I, I don't think I've cored deep enough in Bandon, and I suspect it I don't know. I don't know what what with band if, if there's been higher rates of accretion or higher rates of sedimentation, but definitely in Willapa, we got we hit it at about anywhere from 90 to 120 centimeters beneath the surface, depending on where we were okay. in the marsh. And you just see this huge spike in organic matter right there. So essentially, you see the old kind of surface O horizon, A horizon. So it's a spike in organic matter with that underlain by a sand lens or something. Is it um, yeah, you'll see the texture shift. Same thing. You'll see the texture um, course and on right above this shift in, or, in increase in organic matter. And 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 so where the question? I mean that that would be very interesting to look at and think about. But what what um, having a point in your horizon that you know represents a, uh, an event that occurred a defined time in the past. Does that give you a handle on the development of these soils and these systems that isn't available anywhere else where this kind of research is occurring? Yeah, I think the the thing I, I wish I had up, up at Willip is, is with one of those cores that I could do the, the lead 210 and the cesium so I could tighten up and see if there's been a change in sedimentation rates from prehistoric to historic times. Mm -hmm. But yeah, certainly having that subduction zone earthquake, if we can find it, it gives us a, you know, that nice 300-year record there. Yeah. It's just not, yeah. you know, not sure how much we could say in terms of, we, we could certainly, you know, we've done this. We said, oh, it, it's this rate per year. But what are the odds that it's been that rate every year? Yeah, now, I, it'd be nice to be able to step back at some point and say to somebody that marsh is only 300 years old or something like that. <laughs> right. Just have a representative place where you can say we know that that's, those soils started to develop, but that be, that place reached sea level in 1700, something like that. I, I may be dreaming, but that would be a kind of a cool conclusion. Well, and, and that's and that's why all the, in the Willapa stuff, you know, they're very coarse textured or very silty. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's hardly any clay development. They're just mm -hmm. really young, mm -hmm. young soils. Okay. And uh, um, <laughs> we're taking over the soil. Current. Sorry, sorry, everybody else. <laughs> um, yeah, no, but it, it's. It's there's much more information I think we could glean out of that if we had some more time for this. Okay. There, there's actually a you know a really good record um, from the geology work that's been done and the archaeology work here at Bannon Marsh. Um, we know the stratigraphy down. I think uh, Roy, correct me if I'm wrong about at least seven events, uh, subduction events down, and um, and the distances between those. And, and people have been looking at that. Rob Rob Witter's group. Um, yeah. And um, so. Um, that information is there. I think it could be you could do those interpolations or uh, for rates of recovery um, for some of those 
that information. Um, we know, yeah, for instance, that the Ben and Marsh is, uh, it was open water when the when the in 1850. So mm. that's all accreted and in, in very recently. Um, mm-hmm. It was shallow water. And I was thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. But it was. Uh, it but that's the thing. Thinking about accretion rates is, you know, you, you know, places in Willapa have got a meter of accretion in 300 years. Yeah. Which is more rapid than most of our recent measurements. You know? Yeah, yeah. A lot of logging and stuff. I mean, I, that's one of the other things is that uh, standing in these places and looking upland is seeing where the source of some of these sediments has has been. So, okay, thank and you. And that gets back to our... Yeah. Any other questions or comments? I just wanted to check. Um, so all these, uh, some of these graphics are. I, I'm looking at those and say I really want those. <laughs> some of these recent <laughs> uh, graphics you guys have put together with the elevations and the mapping you've done. So um, this, this whole, um, these powerpoints will be uh, on the available to us through the uh, websites, or how how will we be able to get to these things? Well, that's a good. Uh, point. Usually do, yeah. That's a good point. I am I am recording this. Um, but it might be useful if folks want a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, you know, Martin, if if you don't mind, just 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 you know re- respond all and and go ahead and send that along. And and same with John, that'd be great. If you don't mind, that'd be great. Yeah, and we just, certainly would just reference you guys. as long as everybody knows it's it's forty five minutes of work that went into it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Better stuff yet to come, is that it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're, yeah. we're looking forward to that, but oh, yeah. I'm already yeah. uh, talking a bit here. Yeah, we're just starting this project, and we're pretty much unfunded. And, yeah, so we're <laughs> kind of squeezing it and just in time for today. Join, join, the, rest, join the rest of the crowd. There. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the future great, of though. government, huh? But we are really excited about continuing it for as long as we you know as long as we can because and and expanding it to other sites on the coast because no one's really well it overlaps for example with John Takakawa's group in broadly the questions the very specific ones are really complementary instead of overlapping and I think both are are important to you know to do and I'm glad thank you so much for arranging this call so we know about each other's work and can you know and can keep it in mind and and ideally work together some Great, yeah. So, John, I mean, do do you have any closing comments, John, from your your point of view? No, I, I think it's great to uh, see some of these uh, projects that are overlapping uh, to some extent, but I think they're complementary more than overlapping because, as everyone's noted, that you know there's little differences of how you can look at problems and come up with certainly a lot of interesting kind of approaches to trying to figure out what sea level rise and climate change threats are. So be happy to uh, talk with you guys more uh, mm-hmm. offline on uh, particulars of what we're up to. And, again, our, our focus has kind of been a wider gradient study up and down the coast. And individually at particular sites, we are certainly are happy to work with uh, people wor- locally working at particular problems and, and see where we can kind of collaborate. Yeah, that's great. I'd like to throw in a thought there, and this is a, a last-minute thought, so take that with a grain of salt. And this is uh, uh, from the perspective of uh, J- uh, Jeff Weber in the Oregon Coastal Program, and that is that I'm seeing uh, or I'm becoming um, aware of different efforts to do um, complementary research using different models in different systems. And that presents to the consumers of the outputs from these efforts with a real huge quandary. And I wonder if maybe there is a place for almost a West Coast-wide discussion about uh, to to parse out the best models for certain circumstances and to identify what information is needed um, for management and which elements of that information can be acquired without spending millions of dollars in modeling. 
there's a series of questions and suppositions I'm putting out here, but I think just that in the bigger picture, trying to, um, in effect, select the best models to use for particular circumstances, or is it too early to do that? Uh, this is John. I just would say that we're comparing with East Coast models already. One of our colleagues on our study is Glenn Guttensberg, and, and he and he and the Kerwin, the model I present at the beginning, have done a lot of models of the Atlantic coast. So he's trying to work with us to compare our models with his, as well as some of the larger model efforts, including SLAM yeah. and others that have been done on other refuges, um, to see how they're different and if there's kind of, I think it's the natural evolution of models like this that people try and float different balloons and then they slowly kind of wind back to the ones that are working the best and people kind of get consensus on. So I think we're in that phase of, of people trying different approaches and hopefully coming then to some kind of consensus through time of, uh, of vetting these type of models. That's a good perspective to hear. It's a, it, 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 and maybe we can have this conversation offline. I don't want to consume people's time uh, in a in a uh, pipe dream. But I, the um, it um, maybe that's the way the way to leave it is is that there's probably uh, room for further discussion and and um, maybe the managers can um, help with input into that research process to speed up the that uh, um, collaborative uh, resolve to to come to some conclusions about what syst what models are best to use under what circumstances in which systems sounds like an NC's proposal to me say again sounds like an NC's proposal get everyone together in a workshop and go over the models and talk about them and, and make a decision that's something they could fund uh, uh, if you would send me a lead on that, I can I can uh, pick it up and and well I, I can't I can't run with it, but I will stumble with it. Okay. <laughs> well, we're we're at the five o'clock uh, time, and and I just want to thank everyone for uh, you know sharing all their their data and, and their modeling efforts and and a good discussion and I that that. Probably a good place to end on that visionary note, Jeff. Thank you. So. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to bring it. I mean, this 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 was a really good place. Otherwise, a point like that really is out of context. This is a good place, though, to say, hey, there's yeah. good work going on. Help us figure out what it means and where it can be applied. Hey, David, I'd like to uh, express my appreciation to John and Catherine and all the folks that are doing the research on Van and Mars to to help us understand. Um, uh, where we're going with the restoration and also the natural processes associated with climate change and sea level rise. Um, obviously, we have a very small staff and can't accomplish these things on our own, but I really appreciate the efforts that are going into uh, helping us understand what's going on at Ben and Marsh. And thanks for making the site easy to work at. No kidding, man. <laughs> Good. That's great. Okay, right. well, thank well, you, David. Thank Dave. you. The rest of you guys will right. talk again. Thank you very much for putting this together. Have a good evening, everyone.